Good day, class. Let's discuss ST taxation. Transfer taxes are the taxes imposed upon the gratuitous transfer of private property. It is a tax imposed upon the privilege of passing property or passing ownership of property without any valuable consideration. Under the tax code, transfer taxes refer to the estate tax and donor's tax. Let's tackle some basic principles in estate taxation. What is the essence of estate tax laws? Estate tax laws rest in their essence upon the principle that death of an individual is the generating source from which the taxing power takes its being. And that is the power to transmit or the transmission from the dead to the living on which the tax is more immediately based. So it is the death of an, of an individual that is the reckoning point for the application of estate tax laws. How do we define estate tax and what are the applicable tax rate and tax base? Estate tax is the right to transmit property. This is a tax on the right to transmit property at death and on certain transfers which are made by the statute the equivalent of testamentary dispositions. And this is measured by the value of the property at the time of death. With respect to tax rate, a flat rate of 6% is imposed upon the privilege of the decedent to transmit property at death. And this is based on the entire net estate. So the law enforced at the time of the death of decedent governs estate taxation. So take note, estate tax is applied based on the right to transmit property at the moment of death and in certain instances, transfers mortis causa. And a flat rate of 6% is applied based on the net taxable estate. What is the nature, object, and purpose of estate taxation? As to nature and object, estate tax is laid neither on the property nor on the transfer or the transferee. This is an excise tax or a privilege tax, and its object is to tax the shifting of economic benefits and enjoyment of property from the dead to the living. So the nature of estate tax, this is not a property tax as to nature, but a tax on privilege or privilege tax. As to object, the object is to tax the shifting of economic benefits from the dead to the living. You also have some purposes or justifications in the imposition of estate taxes. What are some purposes for imposing tax or estate tax on transfers? You have, it generates additional revenue to the government. So that is an added income to the government. You also have a the benefit received theory for services that the government renders in the distribution of the estate. You have privilege theory or state partnership. This is not a right tax, but a privilege. So acquired with the protection of the state. You also have ability to pay theory that the transfer of assets or it trans the transfer of assets and makes the transferee able to pay or contribute to the governmental income. And the fifth purpose is the redistribution of wealth theory. So the receipt of inheritance is a contributing factor to the inequalities in wealth and income. It mitigates the evils of inheritance in its original form. What law governs the imposition of estate tax? This is governed by the statute or law enforced at the time of death of the decedent. When does the estate tax accrue? It accrues as of the death of the decedent and the accrual of the tax is distinct from the obligation to pay the same. So it accrues at the time of death but the obligation to pay is different because um, upon death of the decedent, succession takes place and the right of the state to tax the privilege to transmit the estate vests instantly upon the decedent's death. We have two types of taxable transfers. You have inter vivos and mortis causa. How do we distinguish these two types of transfers? For transfer mortis causa, this is a gratuitous transfer after death. So this is either 
intestate or intestate transfer. For transfers inter vivos, so this is this generally attracts donor stacks. However, in certain transfers, um, transfers inter vivos, these are treated as testamentary disposition. So I repeat, there are certain transfers inter vivos which are treated as testamentary dispositions. And accordingly, this is in, such dispositions are included in the computation of gross estate in order to arrive at the proper estate tax liability. So we have some examples of transfer inter vivos. You have transfers in contemplation of debt, transfer with retention or reservation of certain rights, revocable transfers, transfers of property arising under general power of appointment, and transfers for insufficient consideration. So we'll define these examples in a moment. But first, let us classify the types of decedents. The decedents may be classified into Filipino citizen, resident alien, and non-resident alien. Who are resident citizens? Those who have stayed permanently in the Philippines or stayed outside the Philippines for less than 183 days during the taxable year. Meanwhile, non-resident citizens are those who stayed outside the Philippines for 183 days or more during the taxable year. But for estate taxation purposes, all Filipino citizens, whether resident or non-resident Filipinos, and all resident aliens are subject to estate taxes for all properties left at the time of death worldwide, which means all properties left by Filipino citizens and resident alien, then they are subject to estate tax for all properties left in the Philippines and outside the Philippines. So that's worldwide. For non-resident alien, only properties left in the Philippines at the time of death are subject to estate tax laws. So resident alien, these are persons who are not citizens of the Philippines but are residing in the Philippines for more than one year. Non-resident alien, these are foreign individuals whose resident residences are not within the Philippines. Let's review a bit the classification of taxpayers for income tax purposes so, so that um, you can refresh your memory on this topic. For income taxation purposes, I hope you can still recall the distinction between resident citizens and non-resident citizens. Because for resident citizens, for income taxation purposes, they are taxable worldwide. So all income earned by resident citizens are taxable whether earned in the Philippines or outside the Philippines. They're classified as resident citizens if they have permanently resided in the Philippines or if they stayed outside the Philippines for less than 183 days during the taxable year. So resident citizens, they're taxable worldwide. For non-resident citizens or those who stayed outside the Philippines for 183 days or more during the taxable year, for income taxation purposes, they're only taxable for all income earned within the Philippines. How about aliens? They are taxable with it for all income within the Philippines only. You have two types of aliens, resident aliens and non-resident aliens. Resident aliens, they are not citizens of the Philippines but they are residing in our country for more than one year. Non-resident aliens, these are foreign individuals whose residences are not within the Philippines. You have two types of non-resident aliens. Non-resident aliens engage in trade or business and non-resident aliens not engage in trade or business. For the first category or the non-resident aliens engage in trade or business, these are foreign individuals staying in the Philippines for more than 180 days during the taxable year. In such a case, they're considered to have, to have been engaged in trade or business if such non-resident aliens shall have stayed in the Philippines for more than 180 days, but less than one year. Because if they have stayed in the Philippines for more than one year, the presumption in taxation is that they're considered resident aliens. Only less than, 180, less than 180 days that such aliens are considered non-resident. How about non-resident aliens not engaged in trade or business? 
these are foreign individuals who stayed in the Philippines for only 180 days or less during the taxable year. So please take note on the rules regarding the 183 days and 180 days. So if it's resident citizens, the the benchmark is 183 days. For aliens, you have 180 days. But going back to estate taxation, um, for estate tax purposes, Filipino citizens, whether resident or non-resident, and resident aliens are subject to estate tax for all properties left in the Philippines and abroad. For non-resident aliens, only properties left in the Philippines at the time of death are subject to estate taxes. How about residents? What is residence for estate tax purposes? It refers to the permanent home, the place to which whenever absent for business or pleasure, one intends to return and depends on facts and circumstances in the sense that they disclose intent. It is therefore not necessarily the actual place of residence because the term residence and domicile are synonymous and these are used interchangeably without distinction. What comprises gross estate and what is net estate? Gross estate includes all properties and interests of the decedent at the time of his death. Meanwhile, net estate refers to the value of the estate after all deductions have been made against the gross estate and the net estate is subject to 6% tax rate. For resident citizens, I repeat, for residents, resident citizens and non-resident and non-resident Filipino citizens and all resident aliens, all properties, whether real or personal, wherever situated, these are subject to estate taxes, which means to say all properties left by them shall be included in the gross estate. Meanwhile, for non-resident aliens, only properties situated in the Philippines are subject to estate tax, provided that with respect to intangible personal property, its inclusion in gross estate is subject to the rule on reciprocity. Um, we'll discuss in a moment the rule on reciprocity. But first, let us discuss the valuation of gross estate. As a rule, as a general rule, the properties comprising the gross estate shall be valued on or based on the fair market value at the time of death. I repeat, the valuation is fair market value at the time of death. For real properties, the fair market value is determined by the Commissioner of Internal Revenue or the fair market value as shown in the schedule of values fixed by the provincial or city assessors, whichever is higher. For shares of stocks, you have to distinguish listed shares from unlisted shares. For listed shares, the fair market value is the arithmetic mean between the highest and lowest quotation at the date of death or the date nearest the date of death if none is available on the date of death itself. For unlisted shares, for common shares, these are valued based on book value. Meanwhile, preferred shares are valued at par value. Book value class is the net asset value of a company. This is the accounting value of the company's assets, less all claims senior to common equity. The formula for calculating book value per share is the stockholder's equity less the preferred stock divided by the number of common shares outstanding for the company. Let's discuss the tax rates. Previously, or before the effectivity of train law on January 1, 2018, we observe or we apply scheduler tax rate. For net estate below 200,000, that is exempt from estate tax. So while any amount in excess of 200,000 pesos is subject to tax at scheduler tax rates. For example, 
if the net taxable estate is 1 million pesos. So for 1 million pesos, the bracket class is between 500,000 to 2 million pesos. That is the bracket. So the tax, the fixed tax is 15,000 pesos. But there is an additional tax of 8% for any amount in excess of 500,000 pesos. So 500,000 pesos multiplied by 8%, so that is 40,000 pesos. 40,000 plus 15,000 pesos, so the estate tax liability is 55,000 pesos. So the old tax rates or the scheduler tax rates before the effectivity of train law is a little bit complicated. For the taxpayers. That's why Congress amended the tax rates beginning January 1, 2018, pursuant to Republic Act 10963 or train law, which provides that the estate tax rate is now subject to 6%. So the current estate tax is 6%. And this governs all estate tax liabilities beginning January 1, 2018. So for estates of decedents who died prior to January 1, 2018, the graduated scheduler tax rates between or from 5% to 20% under the NIRC shall apply. And estate of decedents beginning January 1, 2018 and onwards the rate of 6% based on the value of such net estate shall apply. How do we determine the gross estate? The determination of gross estate depends on the classification of decedents, if he is a Filipino citizen or resident alien or non-resident alien. As what I have mentioned a while ago, if he is a Filipino citizen, whether resident or non-resident, or if he is a resident alien, all properties left, whether in the Philippines or abroad, are subject to estate taxes. Meanwhile, for non-resident aliens, only properties left in the Philippines are subject to estate taxes. So again, for resident, whether citizen of the Philippines or alien, and citizen, whether resident or non-resident Filipino citizen, all real properties, wherever situated, tangible personal property, wherever situated, and intangible personal property, wherever situated, should be included in the gross estate. Meanwhile, for non-resident alien, only real properties left in the Philippines, tangible personal property, and intangible personal property in the Philippines are subject or must be included in the gross estate. Meanwhile, with respect to intangible personal property in the Philippines, it must also be included in the gross estate, but we will observe the rule on reciprocity. We'll discuss later the rule on reciprocity. So for your bird's eye view, this is the table which provides the summary um, in the determination of gross estate and net estate. Let's move on to the rule on reciprocity. How is the reciprocity rule applied in estate taxation? Under the rule on reciprocity, no estate tax shall be collected in respect to intangible personal property of a non-resident alien decedent if the foreign country of which the decedent was a citizen and resident at the time of his death did not impose a transfer tax of any character in respect to intangible personal property of citizens of the Philippines not residing in that foreign country or if the loss of the foreign country of which the decedent was a citizen and resident at the time of his death allows a similar exemption from transfer tax in respect of intangible personal properties owned by citizens of the Philippines not residing therein. So to summarize, 
the rule on reciprocity only applies to intangible personal property owned by non-resident alien. So, intangible personal property owned by non-resident alien. So, the effect of this reciprocity rule is that any intangible personal property owned by non-resident alien shall not be subject to estate tax in the Philippines if the country of origin of the non-resident alien exempts intangible personal properties owned by Filipino citizens not residing in that foreign country. So, reciprocity. If both states exempt non-residents, the citizens of another foreign state, from transfer taxes in respect of intangible personal property, then the Philippines also observe the, observes the reciprocity rule. In such a case, the intangible personal property owned by non-resident alien who died in the Philippines are not subject to estate taxation. So that is the rule on reciprocity. What are the items to be included in the gross estate? Under Section 85 of the tax code, these are the items to be included in the gross estate. First, you have the decedent's interest. The transfer, second, is transfer in contemplation of death. Third, revocable transfer. Number four, property passing under general power of appointment. Number five, proceeds of life insurance. Number six, prior interest. Number seven, transfers of insufficient consideration. And number eight, capital of the surviving spouse. Reasons for taxability. The property remains substantially that of the transferor during his lifetime, notwithstanding the transfer as he still retains either the beneficial ownership or the naked title to the property. And the transfer is essentially similar in respect to a transmission by intestacy or testacy upon death of the owner. In order to be exempted from estate taxation, inter vivos transmission must be absolute and outright with no strings attached whatsoever by the decedent. Let's tackle one by one these items. The first one is decedent's interest. It includes all properties by the decedent and interest in the property possessed to the extent of the interest therein of the decedent at the time of his death. This includes interest in the property possessed, whether actual or constructive, interest in property owned, and property or interest transferred during his lifetime which partake of the nature of testamentary dispositions. We have examples like dividends declared before death of the shareholder but paid after his death. So that forms part of the decedent's interest. You also have partnership profits even if paid after death of the partner. You also have proceeds of life insurance policy payable to a revocable beneficiary. And the fourth example is the right to use of rock. So as a general rule, all property owned by the decedent has to be included in the gross estate to the extent of the value of his interest in such property at the time of his death. If he owns the whole property, then it must be reported in the gross estate. If his ownership is only proportionate, then such proportion or the value in proportion thereof must be reported in the gross estate as well. How about transfers in contemplation of death? A transfer in contemplation of death is a transfer motivated by the thought of death, although death may not be eminent. But the, the thought of death, not necessarily the contemplation of death, induces the disposition of the property for the purpose of avoiding the payment of estate tax. So if it, if it will be established that the transfer was made by the taxpayer in contemplation of death, then the transfer, the property transferred must be included to the gross estate of the deceased. So the motive or intention, which is a question of fact, 
must be evaluated in determining whether or not a transfer is in contemplation of death. Take note also that the law does not specify the number of years prior to decedent's death within which a transfer can be considered as one in contemplation of death. But it embraces gifts inter vivos despite the fact that they are fully executed even if they are irrevocable and indefeasible. There are certain circumstances which must be taken into account. For example, the age and state of health made the state of health of the deceased at the time of his death. So you have to take into consideration what was the condition of the transfer at the time when the gift was made. Because if he had a deteriorating health at the time of the transfer, then it can be considered as a transfer in contemplation of death. You also have the circumstance of length of time between the gift and the date of death. A short interval suggests the conclusion that the thought of death was in the decedent's mind. Long interval suggests the opposite. You also have to take into consideration perhaps there is a concurrent making of the will within a short time after the transfer. So if there was a transfer at the same time the taxpayer also executed a will, then that is that is already a red flag that perhaps the transfer was made in contemplation of death. But again, I repeat, the motive or intention is a question of fact. There are motives associated with life that prevents the category of transfer in contemplation of death. Number one, if the purpose of the transfer is to relieve the donor from the burden of management, then that is already an indication that the transfer was not made in contemplation of death. Or if the transfer was in order to save income or property taxes, or perhaps the transfer of property was made to settle family litigated disputes, it can also be transferred because the transfer wants to provide independent income for the de dependents. Or number five, the transfer wants to see his children enjoy the property while the donor is alive. That precludes the category of transfer in contemplation of death. Number six, to protect the family from hazards of business operations. And number seven, to reward services rendered. So in any of the forego if any of the foregoing is present, then the transfer is not considered in contemplation of death. You have previous bar examination question. A, he's 90 years old and suffering from incurable cancer. On August 1, wrote a will and on the same day made several inter vivos gifts to his children. Then, 10 days later, he died. In your opinion, are the inter vivos gifts considered transfers in contemplation of death? for purposes of determining properties to be included in his gross estate? Explain your answer. So the suggested answer is, yes, it is or it was a transfer in contemplation of death, the purpose of which was to evade payment of tax. Obviously, uh, the transfer was made at the time when he was already suffering from an incurable disease and it was made concurrent to the making of a will. So such circumstances are indicative that the transfer was made in contemplation of death. How about revocable transfers? Revocable transfers are transfers where the transferor has reserved the right to alter, amend, or revoke such tra transfer. So the transferor he transferred property, but he reserves the right to transfer, amend, or revoke the same, regardless of whether or not the power is actually exercised during his lifetime, and whether or not the power should be exercised by him alone or in conjunction with someone else, so long as that right remains until the day of his death, even if not exercised, then such transfer is considered revocable transfer. So the property involved must be included in the gross estate. It is sufficient that the decedent had the power to revoke, though he did not exercise the power to revoke. So long as he has the right to alter, amend, or revoke such transfer during his 
lifetime. Any revocable transfer must be included in the gross estate because it is it is as if the property is still under the control of the decedent. So it is part of his properties because he actually will enjoy the income, the rights, and the enjoyment of the property. We have an example. John, 60 years old, donated a parcel of land with a fair market value of 1 million in favor of his son, Pedro, with the condition that John retains the power to amend or terminate the transfer at will. Peter died ahead of John. Upon John's death, will the parcel of land be included as part of his gross estate? The answer is, obviously, this is a type of revocable transfer. So the value of the property is included in the gross estate of John because he has the power to alter, amend, or revoke such transfer and such right is exercisable or the right remains until the day of his death. The fourth item to be included in the gross estate pertains to property passing under general power of appointment. So how are properties passing under a power of appointment treated for estate tax purposes? Any property passing under a GPA shall form part of the gross estate. General power of appointment refers to the right to designate the person or persons who will succeed the property of prior decedent, which may be exercised in favor of anybody. So these are the requisites for properties passing under general power of appointment. Number one, there is an existence of a general power of appointment. So note of the relationship between the donor and the donee or transfer transferee. Second requisite is the exercise of such power by the decedent donee by will or deed in certain cases and passing of property by virtue of such right. So the property passing under general power of appointment comes from the donor and the donee accepts it. The donee, at the time of his death, who is holding a property passing to him pursuant to a general power of appointment, is considered the owner of the property. The estate of the decedent donee must be made liable for the payment of the estate tax because here, the power to dispose at death by the exercise of a power of appointment is equivalent to ownership. So it is a potential source of wealth to the appointee and the disposition of wealth affected by its exercise or relinquishment at, at death is one form of the enjoyment of wealth. For the decedent donee, his gross estate shall include any property passed or transferred under general power of appointment pursuant to a will or by a deed executed in contemplation of or intended to take effect in possession or enjoyment at or after his death or by a deed by which or under which he has retained for his life the possession or enjoyment or the right to income of the property from the property or the right either alone or in conjunction with any person to designate the persons who shall possess or enjoy the property or the income therefrom. Again, for properties passing under general power of appointment, the nature here is the donee has power to appoint any person who he chooses who shall possess or enjoy the property without any restriction. So the tax implication is it makes appointed property for all legal intents the property of the donee. So the donee who accepts or who holds properties pursuant to a general power of appointment must include the same in his gross estate because that is a property passing under gen the general power of appointment. So the effect here is the donee holds the appointed property with all the attributes of ownership under the concept of an owner. How about if the property was transferred to the to a donee pursuant to a special power of appointment? So here, the donee must appoint successor to the property only within a limited group or class of persons. The tax implication here is 
it is not includable in the gross estate of the donee when he dies. So the effect, the donee holds the appointed property in trust or under the concept of a trustee. You get the distinction? For a property passing under general power of appointment, the donee is considered to have owned the property. So he holds, he holds the appointed property with all the attributes of ownership. Since he's the owner, then the estate must include properties passing under general power of appointment. But if what he holds is a special power of appointment, then the property is merely held in trust or under the concept of trustee. So when the transferee donee dies, then the estate is not required to include the property passing under special power of appointment. So to recap, only properties passing under general power of appointment must be included in the gross estate. Moving on to another topic, we have the proceeds of life insurance, which must also be included in the gross estate. Amounts receivable by the estate of the deceased, executor or administrator, under policies taken out by the decedent upon his own life, whether or not insured, retain the power of revocation, or receivable by any beneficiary except if the designation is irrevocable, must be included in the gross estate. When is it taxable? For proceeds of life insurance, the proceeds must be included in the gross estate if the beneficiary is the estate itself, the estate of the deceased. So if the beneficiary of the life insurance policy is the estate and the designation is whether revocable or irrevocable, it doesn't matter so long as the beneficiary is the estate, automatically you include that in the gross estate. So proceeds of life insurance, if the beneficiary is the estate, you must report the same as part of the gross estate. Second, if the beneficiary is other than the decedent, so it's not the estate, if the beneficiary is other than the estate, but the designation is revocable, then you must also include the proceeds of life insurance in the gross estate. Again, if the beneficiary is other than the estate of the deceased, but the designation is revocable, then you must also include the proceeds of life insurance in the gross estate. If the beneficiary is other than the estate and the designation is irrevocable, then you are not required to report the same in the gross estate. So I hope it's, it's now clear. If the beneficiary is the estate of the deceased, whether revocable or irrevocable, include that in the gross estate because the life insurance is... A, in real sense, a testamentary disposition. Or if the beneficiary is other than the decedent, but the designation of the beneficiary is revocable, then it's still subject to estate tax. It's taxable. When not taxable, if it pertains to accident insurance proceeds or proceeds of group insurance taken out by the company for its empl employees, it's not taxable because the tax code speaks only of policies taken out by the decedent upon his own life. So we should not stretch the law or the coverage of the law. Third, amount receivable by a beneficiary irrevocably designated by or in the policy of insurance by the insured. It's not taxable. Why? Because the transfer is absolute, no strings attached, and the insured did not retain any legal interest in the insurance. Um, GSIS insurance policies and SSS um, benefits, also not taxable. The sixth one, prior interest, it applies to transfers, trust, estates, interest rights and powers and relinquishments of powers, whether made, created, arising, existing, exercise, or relinquished before or after the effectivity of the tax code. This is a catch-all provision to ensure that everything will be considered in determining the gross estate. So again, the rule on prior interest is that it provides that transfers in contemplation of debt, revocable transfers, and proceeds of life insurance, whether made, created, arising, 
existing exercise or relinquished before or after the effectivity of a tax code shall be included in the decedent's gross estate. Number seven, transfers for insufficient consideration. These are transfers that are not bona fide sales of property for an adequate and full consideration in money and money's worth. So the transfer property must fall under any of the following transfer in contemplation of death, revocable transfer, or property passing under a general power of appointment. Otherwise, the transaction is subject to donor's tax. So we have rules to consider in evaluating whether or not a transfer is for insufficient consideration. Rule number one, if it is a bona fide sale, so that is not considered as a transfer for insufficient consideration. So for a bona fide sale, um, no value shall be included in the gross estate. Second rule is with respect to non-bona fide sale. If it's not a bona fide sale, then the excess of the fair market value at the time of death over the value of the consideration received by the decedent shall form part of his gross estate. We'll, we'll cite an example later. And the third rule is if the inter vivos transfer is fictitious or simulated, then the entire fair market value of the property transferred at the time of death shall be included in the gross estate. We have an example. Under the first scenario on bona fide sale. So if it is a bona fide sale, no value shall be included in the gross estate. We have scenario number one. Let's say a property was transferred at 2 million pesos during transfer and the property's fair market value at the time of death is or was 2.5 million. When the property was transferred, let's say the property was sold, the taxpayer or the transferer received 2 million pesos as a consideration. In such scenario, this is considered as a bona fide sale because the fair market value at the time of transfer is equal to the consideration received. Again, if it is a bona fide sale, then no value shall be included in the gross estate. What if it falls under the second scenario, which is uh, one that is not a bona fide sale? Let's tackle this example. Let's say a property was transferred, the fair market value was 1.5 million pesos at the time of transfer. However, the taxpayer had only received 800,000 pesos at the time of sale or transfer. So obviously, there's a huge disparity between the fair market value at the time of transfer, 1.5 million, versus consideration received amounting to 800,000 pesos at the time of sale or transfer. Under this premise, the rule is, if it is not a bona fide sale, the excess of the fair market value at the time of death over the consideration received shall form part of the gross estate. Again, the rule is the excess of the fair market value at the time of death over the consideration received must be reported as part of the gross estate. In scenario number two, fair market value at the time of death was 2 million pesos. Consideration received during the sale, 800,000 pesos only. So the difference between 2 million pesos and 800,000 pesos is 1.2 million. This is some, the amount or value to be included in the gross estate because the transfer was for insufficient consideration. And the third scenario is if it is if the inter vivos transfer was proven um proven fictitious or simulated the rule is that the entire fair market value of property at the time of death must be included in the gross estate. Let's have an example. Let's say the property's, the property's fair market value at the time of transfer was 1.8 million. However, there was no consideration received at all by the transfer. Obviously, the sale was fictitious or simulated. Under the, under the tax code, the value, the, the value to be included in the gross estate must be the fair market value of the property transferred at the time of death. So here, the fair market value was 2 million pesos. So 2 million pesos is the value to be included in the gross estate. And finally, number eight, capital of the surviving spouse in relation to section 86C of the tax code, the share of the surviving spouse in the conjugal partnership properties impliedly included in 
the gross estate. 